Welcome to another installment of Youth X Live. Get ready to learn and be inspired by our change maker, Rich Mnisi. Let our experts unlock your potential by enabling your personal progress and development. And now, your host for today, the one and only Pamela Mdanga. Are you looking to start a clothing or fashion label, perhaps pursue a career in the fashion and beauty industry, or simply learn how to acquire skills through formal education and internships? Well, you have come to the right place because today we'll be taking you on a fashion and beauty journey. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Pam Lamtanga and you are officially welcome to the NetBank Youth X Live event. My name is Pam Lamtanga yet again. Uh, so two weeks ago, we celebrated uh, youth, ex, uh, youth Day rather in style as NetBank hosted the Arts and Entertainment uh, Youth X Live event with our change maker, Shaw Majorzi. So even though Youth Month is over, we are encouraging you to keep the conversation going and stay connected to Youth X because we are here to inspire you and provide you with tools to help you unlock your full potential. Today is the start of a new month and we hope you are ready for more. It's the fashion and Beauty Youth X Live event featuring the one and only Rich Mnisi. And all that is there for me to say is lights, camera, fashion. So if this is your first time joining us today and you're wondering what is Youth X and why does it exist? So let me tell you why. So on Tuesday, the 1st of June, Statistics South Africa released data showing that the unemployment rate increased by 0.1% to 32.6% in quarter four of 2020 compared to quarter four of 2020, reaching its highest rate since the 2008 global crisis. So this means that over 63% of the unemployed individuals are young people between the ages of 15 and 34. So to demonstrate our commitment to the youth as NetBank, we launched YouthX, a platform designed to connect passionate youth with like-minded individuals who are also seasoned change makers who have seen success in their respective journeys and can inspire the youth to unlock their potential. So I'm talking about the likes of Rich Mnisi, Shaw Majorzi, Amanda Lamini, Candice Chira, Rivom Flari, and Theo Baloy, who are all seasoned change makers dedicated to making their mark as the youth of South Africa. So on today's installment, this is what you can expect in the world of fashion and beauty. We'll kick things off with Talk X, which will be led by our change maker for fashion and beauty, Rich Mnisi, followed by Money Talks with Sisandi Lekikido, head of retail investments at NetBank, a power panel with our local change maker. She is a beauty and fashion content creator and YouTuber, Ulandi Gama, popularly known as Lanzi Gama, our financial expert C. Sandy Ligido, our change maker Richem Nisi, which will be facilitated by our news anchor journalist and our facilitator for the day TV presenter Abigail Fisachi. So during each segment please do you feel free to interact by asking questions and keep it unlocked to the Youth X platform. We have loads in store for you including cash prizes, networking opportunities and the hottest ticket in town, the Youth X summit you do not want to miss that so one of the easiest ways for you guys to earn points is by voting on the polls so head over to the website and vote on today's polls the polls not only assist you in earning points but they also ensure that netbank answers questions that you need answers to and continue to equip you with the skills that you need to unlock your full potential talk x so now let's get into the first part of the show with our fashion and beauty change maker, Rich Mnisi. He's a multidisciplinary award-winning fashion designer. Mnisi's brand was born from his yearning to connect deeper with his unique culture and heritage and tell a compelling story through his art. The 2015 Essence Best in Black Fashion Awards, Emerging Designer of the Year, Forbes 30 Under 30 Class of 2019 inductee, Ladies and gentlemen, oh, please help me welcome Rich Mnisi. Hello, my name is Rich Mnisi. I am the founder and creative director of 
Richmond Nisi, founded in September of 2015. Um, the brand is a contemporary multidisciplinary fashion brand. Um, so today for our Youth X Masterclass for Fashion and Beauty, I will take you through how I started the brand and the key aspects that we highlight to keep the success of the brand. Um, so I guess we'll start at the beginning. So um, I was exposed to fashion and creativity at a very young age. My sister was a fine artist at the time and she always wanted to stand out so she would bleach her clothes, sew them, paint them. She would just always like deconstruct her clothing. And I remember like a turning moment for me was when um, she took a string of wool and she tied it on the one end of the room to the other. And then she knotted distressed um, soft dread onto the string to make an afro. And it was such a long, tedious process, but it inspired me to want to like contribute to the world of creation. Um, and I think I took it a little too far and I cut up my mother's clothes and curtains and wrapped them around my body. Um, and it always got me into trouble. Over time, I developed um, new interests and I thought I'd end up being a lawyer, an architect. Um, but then career day came and a fashion school called Lysoff came to my high school and I was exposed to like the different opportunities that exist within the fashion industry and I was just taken by it. And now I had to convince my family of, you know, this great desire of becoming a fashion designer. Um, something that they thought was frivolous. I, I, and my mother is a teacher and she worked two to three jobs to, you know, to raise us. So she needed her kids to go take career paths that were sustainable and like offered security. Um, and that didn't necessarily align with who I was and who I am. So I convinced my family that I would make this work and I would uh, do everything in assisting with like school fees and school supplies and, and, and. And then, and that's exactly what I did. When I went into school first year, I had two, three jobs. I was interning for Abigail Betts. I was working for a fashion brand called Augustine. And I also interned for Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week. And with all that experience, you get experience that you'll never get from a school um, because you are entering a functioning business with failures and uh, successes and problems as well. Um, and it just helps you identify things that you want to do in, have in your business and things that you don't want to have in your business. So after, after graduating, I entered a competition called AFI Fast Track, which I ended up winning. And I think I was bullied into like the fashion industry because of all the media attention. And with that, with my, with my prize money, um, it was 10,000 rand. And with 5,000 rand, I had to basically pay everyone back that I had borrowed money from um, to create the collection. And the remaining 5,000, I bought my first industrial sewing machine, an overlocker. And I turned my mother's garage into my studio and prematurely launched my first fashion line, which was called Oath. And with Oath, I think I used that brand as research. I used it to find my voice, uh, knowing my design voice and knowing how to function in the industry, what people want, what people don't want, and just the general chain of the fashion industry, how it works from start, from the beginning of the garment to the end. And I use that brand as like research. And I think it was such an important part because I didn't work like everyone else. I literally went from graduating into a brand and it's such a heavy thing to commit to. It's something that I actually wouldn't advise because I think there's so much learning that you can get from other people. There's so many mistakes that you can avoid in life um, when you are patient. I think for me, it was just more of responding to the hype, um, which was a faulty thing in hindsight. Um, but did it anyway. And for our um, spring summer 16 uh, campaign, I collaborated with um, Kristen Lee Molman and Gabrielle Kanemeyer. Um, for our campaign and with this I wanted to celebrate my family, my family's teachings and also um, celebrate queer people and place queer people in spaces where they were denied. Um, so with this it was more about wanting to be seen and creating realistic images that I grew up seeing but were minimized. So for example when people from where I grew up see two white people of the same sex holding hands, they immediately distance themselves from that intimacy and call it 
Western. But so I wanted to create an image bank of two black people holding hands so that it is something that is normalized and something that you also like, so it clicks in your brain that it's something that you've seen and it's something that doesn't offend you. It's something that doesn't hurt you. And it's something that doesn't concern you. Um, and it was just, the, the brand was then dedicated to creating images that were almost erased by history or erased by people because they didn't want to engage in that conversation. Um, so the idea of telling these undocumented stories led to um, us celebrating my family. And Mwamla Mola, who is my late great-grandmother, who um, I've never met, we don't know when she was born, there's no photos of her. Um, I felt the need to dedicate five um, collections to her and her existence. And in between the collections, there was a furniture piece that I made, uh, which was a structure of her body. And this represented her presence. She will always be known and everyone around the world would know her name. I think it's very important for creatives to work within multiple disciplines. Um, it informs how you put together something and it also gives you opportunities on how to package your idea. Um, so for instance, I studied um, fashion design, styling, uh, business management and photography. And with photography, it wasn't necessarily to become a photographer, but just to learn how the art is created. And photography is such an important part of a fashion line because you need it for lookbooks, campaigns, um, and e-commerce. So I needed the know-how on how to create all these pieces. And it also having that technical know-how eliminates the idea of impossible because you can find practical, cost-effective ways of creating an idea when you know how to create it yourself. Uh, visual communication is something that's very important to our brand. Um, what it does is that it creates images that people associate with your brand. So when people think of the color green, they think of Nedbank. And that's what you do. You need to create images that cannibalize anything that has likeness to your product. So every time people see something that's like your product, they think of you immediately and they immediately gravitate to purchasing your product first. Um, and it's something that, you know, we try and, you know, push every, every single season. And it goes back to one of our most iconic pieces. When people see turtlenecks, they think of the Rich Nisi jumper, um, which was which was a mistake, to be honest. It was one of the pieces that I hated with my entirety, like my whole soul. Um, I don't know, it arrived on the day that I was um, doing a runway show and I didn't like how it looked and I didn't like the fact that it had my name on it. And it became one of the most iconic pieces we've ever created. And this was such a great testament to letting go sometimes. I think as designers, you work so hard on something and you're so close to it that you can't see it from a different eye. So sometimes stepping back and letting mistakes happen can be the greatest thing to a creative. Being a creative in South Africa can be very hard, especially with limited resources, limited capital and load shedding. So you need to find creative ways to create sustainably as well. Uh, for instance, you would create a collection today and it would only retail in two to six months. Um, and by the time you go back to your wholesalers, your wholesalers and resellers of your fabrics, uh, you find that it's sold out and you'd lose out on boutiques and all the, the people that were willing to buy your collection. And it just sets you back as a business. So what we did is that we focused a lot on Photoshop and Illustrator and creating our own prints on our clothing. And what that did is that it helped, you know, eliminate the search of different fabrics and making sure that there's those fabrics every single season. Um, and we focused on testing those fabrics and making sure that we know how they work, how they last and, 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 and print on them and expose all the artwork that we developed on um, Photoshop and Illustrator onto the garments. And that was just a creative way of starting the business and not being overwhelmed by the limitations that we have. Um, this also was something that we experienced when we launched our online store, which was almost 
we weren't necessarily ready to launch an online store. It wasn't something that was um, coming soon, but we launched it as a response to what was happening, what is currently happening. We're in level five. And when um, our president told us that we could start producing masks to sell, uh, we took that opportunity and we launched our e-commerce store just to sell that, um, just to sustain ourselves because we weren't functioning. We couldn't work. No one could work. Our employees were not doing anything. It was just such a tricky time. So we had to start working again. And with that, I think the, the learning was being able to take advantage of the internet. There's so many ways to work on the internet um, without a lot of resources. All you need is all you need really is the internet. And that's what we did. We launched the store. We made sure that we were active and we made sure that we started selling and it started small, it started with the mask. We sold that and then it developed it into a collection and, 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 and that's how we built the store. It wasn't necessarily something that we built and there were like 5,000 products on there. It, there was literally just eight masks and that was it. And it form, it informed the next um, drop and the next drop. And that's how we grew the online store, which is probably one of the biggest successes of the brand. I think without it, the brand would be completely different today. It wouldn't be received the same. So collaborations are very important to the Richard brand. I think with collaborations, there's so many learnings. You learn how um, corporates work and you learn how your IP works and your trademarks. And it also teaches you how to work with someone else and have mutual benefit um, without one being minimized. And usually if you're working with a corporate, the person that will be compromised is probably you. So it just teaches you to know your brand, know what you stand for so that those notes are always hit whenever you work with someone else. And with through collaborations, that's when we found out that um, the Richem Nisi brand was trademarked by someone else in China. This meant that we couldn't, we couldn't trade in one of the biggest markets in the world. And it's been a battle that's been going back and forth for the past two years. And we only secured the Richem, we only bought back the Richem Nisi brand uh, in May of 2021. And it just shows you how you have to make sure that the back end grows as fast as the front end. Um, because what this means is that more exposure is more risk. So you need to make sure that you always protect yourself. You need to make sure you, you talk to your friends and family and professionals on how to protect your work and your brand name and all that it encompasses because every time you throw something into the internet. You are literally th throwing it into the world and it's not illegal for them to uh, register your brand. It's actually fully fine. So you need to make sure that you're protecting yourself against those things. So from considering visual communication, creating from an authentic place, trademark, I think it's very important to make sure that you are thorough about the journey that you're about to take on. Think about it, don't do what I did and jump into it, learn as much as you can from other people. But also with that, don't be scared to make mistakes. Uh, the, great, the greatest things can come from mistakes. And yeah, create, don't be scared, don't be shy. We need your voice. The world needs to hear what South Africans have to say and what South Africans can create. Amazing things come out from South Africans, to be honest. Um, so yeah, do your thing and thank you so much for watching my masterclass. What a phenomenal masterclass. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did and you're inspired as much as I am. Thank you for sharing your thank story. You, you. I don't think you share your story enough. It's, it's really inspiring, but I'm so glad you chose this platform yes, to share thank it. You, yeah. Amazing. I think it's time for us to go straight into the questions because it's already buzzing today. Uh, I, I see you quite popular. You're quite popular. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first question comes from uh, Doze Mosia. I hope I said your name right. Apologies if I didn't. Would you say you learned more in fashion school than you've learned outside of school about your career field? Mm, I definitely learned outside of school. I think mm. you learn so much while you're practicing. Because school is a bubble. You know, you just, I don't know, it's very different from real life. Yes. Real life, there's real challenges. There's... You're working with real bodies. I mean, at school, you work with mannequins and uh, there's no movement. So you learn a lot when you're practicing, definitely. Oh, okay, cool. 
That's quite interesting. So the second question that we are uh, having from Usinazo Nongena is, how do you go about determining your retailing selling price? And what advice would you give to startups who want to go to the luxury, uh, in the luxury, luxury route in South Africa? That's a really good one. Um, I you think... just wake up and say, actually, <laughs> this looks like it could be... Never. Yeah. <laughs> no, that would be so bad. <laughs> um, it's just a matter of like deciding what type of brand you want to have and where you want to place it. And then you have to work towards that and like formulate. So, so if you want to have an entry level brand, you pick entry level fabrics. The production mm. is like that. The way you package it, the way you sell it, and, and, and. So if you want to go luxury, everything has to change has from to be fabric luxury. and, and, and. But also be, beyond that, I think. You know, you have to function ethically. So that does, you know, hike up the price a little because, I mean, we we want to make sure that everyone we work with, uh, from our suppliers to our employees, they need to be compensated mm. uh, for the amazing work that they do. So we don't... What's the word? What's the word? Exploit. We don't short exploit. Short changes, exploit. Yes, yes, which the fashion industry is known for. So we don't do that. That's why ah. things can look different from... Other. A pricing perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice would you give this person who wants to go the luxury route uh, from a fashion perspective? I, it's it's the, definitely that it's just making the decision and making sure that oh. you put everything in the pot that speaks luxury. Yeah, um, speaks luxury. So you yeah. can't say... 50k for an item that time the zipper is five rand right oh it's just, you makes have to, sense oh, yeah it has to <laughs> connect the commas have to communicate <laughs> so the next question is when you started your uh brand did you go solo or you had a team and what would you suggest for an any uh upcoming designers so when I started, I started uh, my first label. It was called Oath, and I started with with my best friend. And yeah, so with that, it was just really experiencing the fashion landscape and learning from it. And when I was ready to step into like the commitment that a business is, um, rebranded and named it Rich Mnisi, and with that, started on my own. And then grew a team, very slow. Like even now, our team is very small. Um, in total, there's seven of us. That's it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's a very small team and we do things together and like it's, yeah, everyone's hands on, which is beautiful. Beautiful. So the next question is, um, so in 2021, where everyone is trying to succeed in the midst of the pandemic, how are you able to keep on building your personal brand and fashion label? This one is from Jillian Sito. I think you also mentioned about um, the difficulty with, with regards to trend, uh, trading rather during the pandemic and querying stuff and just designing stuff during that time. So how were you able to maneuver that? Uh, it, it was tricky from, you know, especially cause like most of our team is like elderly people. So it was a risk, like it was very risky. Um, we just had to be careful, um, especially during, um, level five, because that was the beginning of it. So we're still finding our way now. We, we've gotten into the, like mm. the rhythm of it. Um, but it was, it was also very good because, you know, you were forced to take advantage of the internet and look at the internet and see what opportunities you can get. And, you know, everyone was at home, so everyone was bored on the internet so you could interact with them mm. and just get to know your customer. And like for us, I mean, during, it was during level, I think level four, beginning of level four, that's when we launched um, the Rich Nisi Jumper and Twitter went crazy. And it was such a beautiful story for us because it was you know, we were just releasing clothes mm. and we couldn't even keep up with the demand because we didn't produce a lot and so many people bought mm. and every single two weeks we were sold out, sold out, sold out. So it was such a beautiful thing. Uh, what, you know, while the pandemic wasn't beautiful, but forcing us to stay home and like look at things inwards was very beautiful. Beautiful. So a question that I would like to ask you for anyone who's starting out and they don't have the privilege of entering a competition and yeah. getting 10K, how do they get started in terms of uh, as far as finances are involved? That's a really tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's such a 
call NetBank. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. NetBank Unlocked Me has all the solutions for you for anyone who wants to start up uh, their business or, or just uh, b- basically start their side hustle or turn their side hustle mm. into a business. We have all the so- solutions for you. Just head on over to, to www.unlock.me today and make sure Make sure you get all the right things and do the right things to be like Rich Nisi one day. And also take charge of all the opportunities around Definitely. you because you entered a competition and you actually believe like, actually, I'm going to win this competition. You right. did, right? Yeah. Amazing. Let me find another question. You're, you, 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 you're too popular. I can't keep up. There's way too many questions. <laughs> so uh, how is the growth in pro-black business consumers benefiting <clears throat> your brand? Do you think we do it enough in South Africa? That is a really good question. Mm, I mean, it's, it's going there. I think it's also... It's going there. Yeah, yes. it's going there. I think also something with the whole black lives matter movement and people looking at black businesses was a good trigger for people because it black lives matter was a global campaign yes. and so it even affected south africans mm-hmm. and people started looking at other black businesses i mean people like makosa and Tebe Maguga are doing so well mm-hmm. and they're black businesses and I don't know, I think people are starting, starting to Starting to place yeah. the same value, yes. Yes, as they do to international brands. Mm. And I think also the way that, you know, the creators and designers of today package their work, it just insists on being better than all the other luxury brands. Mm. So I think it's just a matter of if you're a designer or creative, you need to take yourself very seriously. And you need to create work that is so, po- like, it needs to look polished. I think even with... When I started the brand was the main thing, which was a bad thing, but um, the main thing was like how the brand looks from the outside. So like I needed to make sure that I create a brand that looks like it has like 7,000 employees, but there's only one person, but it's just making sure that everything looks so polished (laughs) that like it's convincing to everyone else so that like you don't always have to prove yourself like why is this good? 1,000 rand, why? Yeah. This is it. This is the quality of work that we create. Yeah. So you have to prove that like it's 7K plus yeah. 7K and that is it. You don't go to the other lucky and if brands you ask, and ask. This is, yeah, this is how we arrived at that. Yes. And it's definitely creating from a conscious point of view. Mm. I think, you know, you need to be ethical. You need to make sure that yes. you know how that garment came about and yes. what it means to different people and where it's going, where this piece of fabric is going to end up at the end of the day. So it's just things like that. Amazing. Let me ask you one more question. I see you guys are still buzzing. Right. Okay. The next uh, question. <laughs> Whew, I'm putting you on the spot here. Oh, uh, uh, Michelle is Mahangana <laughs> is asking, do you have a mentorship program? And if yes, how can one be a part of it? We would love to. I don't know. We're still, as a team, we're still thinking, of, we're still thinking about how, especially because like, with the pandemic things going keep progressing and then we're moving backwards like mm. right now we're so backwards mm. um so it's made it tricky to make that decision and open up the open up for people to come learn from us so mm. i think with time with um, time well, definitely yeah. but in the meantime i think you can definitely access rich Mnisi through the unlock.me youth x platform yes. to make sure you ask him any questions that you may have and they will definitely be attended to and that is how we as netbank are giving you access to your change makers that you absolutely love and adore thank you so much rich Mnisi, for joining you. us today looking as stylish as always imagine thank if you. i you didn't so show stunning. up looking good <laughs> next to this amazing <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing. for you to put your money where your mouth is. Open a NetBank Unlock.me account today with these simple and easy steps. Click on the hamburger menu on the top left of your screen. Select open an Unlock.me account. If you are on mobile, scroll to the bottom of the page and select open a bank account or bundle. Insert your age and follow the steps and you will be ready with your Unlock.me account. If you are on desktop, here's how you can do it. Click on open an unlock.me account click on apply on the top right of your screen click on bank then accounts and bundled offerings 
show me all accounts, scroll down to unlock.me, start your application and you are ready to see money differently. Remember that interacting on the YouthX platform earns you points, whether you are uploading a profile picture, asking a question, or even voting on a poll. You earn points and stand a chance to win awesome prizes courtesy of the NetBank YouthX Unlock.me partners. And they are Fashion Fusion, Jukes, Sphinx, and Bitvis Waltons. Thank you so much to our lovely sponsors for the awesome prizes. Money Talks. Now, we all know that money can be a sensitive topic, but not over here. It's always informative, easy to understand, and compelling enough to get you excited to take charge of your money matters. Leading today's money talk is Sisandi Lekikido, Head of Retail Investments at NetBank. Take it away. Good morning, Youth Xers, and thank you, Pam, for that lovely um, introduction. I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope um, you'll take some uh, nuggets out of this next session, which is our money conversation, and I'm going to try and make it as relatable as I, can, I, as I can. Before that, though, I'd like to say happy belated Youth Month, and more importantly, happy Savings Month. Now, as you know, July is National Savings Month, and I hope that after today's conversation, you'll be putting some money away for your future um, and make sure that your future is taken care of. So today I'm going to talk to you about my story, um, lessons that I've learned, mistakes that I've made, what the future looks like for me, and I'm just going to talk to you about what I wish I knew when I was your age. So... About 16 years ago, I come from PE. It's actually not called PE anymore, it's called Tabeja. <laughs> so I come from Tabeja. 16 years ago, I, I worked um, as a waitress. I worked in shoe shops, anything that, you, that I could find to save up enough money to get onto a bus and come to Johannesburg to build a dream. I just wanted to be somebody. I wanted to live a life that I couldn't live back home because I found myself, after finishing the trick, having to sit at home and not have anything to do. And I decided that that was not going to be the story for my life. So as you know, they say, you've got to have a dream. Because if you don't have a dream, how are you going to make that dream come true? So after having saved my money, I got onto that yellow bus and I came to Joburg. So I won't call my story a Jimmy comes to Jovic story. It's a Cesar comes to Santon. Took me a long time to get to Santon, but hey, man, I got there. 16 years ago, I came here, like I said, after finishing the trick, I started a learnership program at one of the other banks, and that's where my journey really began. I started in the learnership program, like I said, and following those um, intensive questioning and, and, and exams and all those grilling sessions, I was not made permanent like my other um, colleagues. Then I, I, I walked into one of the call centers. I used to make coffee, make photocopies. I used to be literally the skivvy of the entire contact center. After a few months, um, one of the contact center agents resigned and there was a space open right there. I contacted IT and I told them to configure my um, computer and put me on the system. And that's how my journey started. I literally gave myself a job. I wouldn't say you should try this wherever you are, but it just says to me that I, I really was serious about taking my life and taking the ball by the horns. That was an incredible um, learning curve for me because I learned so much about financial services and it really propelled me into other roles that I then um, held in various other um, financial institutions. It was a great learning, great exposure, but you know what? It was really hard. It was hard for me because I don't know about you, I was never taught about money. I come from a family and an environment where we don't talk about money because it's rude. We don't talk about money because money doesn't grow on trees. That's all I ever heard about money. So what happened when I started making money? I didn't know, I didn't know what to do with it, except for spend it, of course. 
Um, I also didn't know how to save money and put money away because that was not even a concept I was thinking about. And maybe me, much like most of you, I had a family to take care of. Back at the Becha. So I couldn't set boundaries. I spent my money on people and I set expectations that were extremely unrealistic. And that brings me to my next point, making money mistakes. So I took my money, I bought a car. That was not a bad thing because I remember walking to work and getting rained on. And in that moment, I was like, nah, fam, this is not for me. But I didn't, I couldn't afford the car. So anyway, walked into a dealership, bought the car. Thank goodness at the time I worked for a bank and that kind of helped me. But what did I do? I thought, oh, this car costs, I think back, back in the day, the car installment was something like two and a half thousand rand. And I was like, oh, I can afford two and a half thousand when I look at my payslip. I can do this. Mm, not really. That car came with a balloon payment. That car came with car insurance. That car came with petrol. That car came with maintenance. Okay? And I did not budget for that. Back then, a liter of petrol cost five rand. I remember driving to a garage and filling up with 15 rand because I, I was baroque. I couldn't sleep in the car, so I had to pay rent. Right? And at the end of the month, I had nothing. Remember, I still had to send money back home. Bad choice was buying a car I could not afford. Not walking a little bit longer. I could have found a second-hand car. But your girl didn't want to be played like that, right? And I ended up playing myself. Thereafter, I took out my first loan. Actually, it was a credit card. Took out my first credit card because I wanted to impress my family. Sent the money home and they spent it. They didn't even do what I asked them to do. Broke my heart, but it's now mended. The lesson there, though, is not don't give money to your family or don't help your family out. Please don't get me wrong. And I, I, I don't even like the um, concept of black tax. For me, I call it black love. I love being able to help my family out. I love being able to be responsible and, 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 and provide for my family. So that for me is not tax. It is my love language. However, I've had to learn that my love language needs boundaries. I would have done what I needed to do at home, but I could have taken longer to do it. And I could have managed those expectations and saved instead of getting myself into debt. That was the first of many bad choices around debt and managing debt. So don't get me wrong, there is good debt. And what I did right was get into some good debt, like buying myself a home, my first home right? And making sure that that home was paid up every single month. And by paid up, I mean paying my installment every single month. I got insurance, etc., and I got that sorted. But there was also a lot of bad debt because I also wanted to be CISA comes to Santon. What do you guys call it now? Soft life. I wanted to have my soft life. I wanted to be in places I had no business being in because I could not afford it. I could not afford the cocktails that I was having in Santon. I could not afford the clothes that I was wearing. Oh, and I got into some, into some store um, clothing accounts debt as well. At some point, I had four store clothing accounts. Four. One person. And in there as well, I needed to impress my family. I needed to show them that I could do things for them. Found myself in a situation where I had to move out of my home and move in with family. Because I was over my head. I was in over my head. I had a car. Oh, I changed my car. I changed my car to something German, something slick, something gorgeous. Because I was like, hey, your girl is making more money. I've just got a new job. I've done all of this. And every time I left a job, because I stayed about two years at every job. Every time I left a job, what I do? I took my pension money and I went broke. It was amazing. Looking back, I think to myself, what could I have done differently? What are the lessons I wish I knew back then? Firstly, I wish I knew that saving is a psychology and saving is not about having money. Saving is about taking the money that you have and taking from that, putting it aside for my future self. What am I going to do differently going, going forward? So the last 16 years for me have been about learning lessons. I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to also get educated. I went to varsity. I took myself to varsity. Those are some of the good things I did. 
I have since bought my third property. I have, um, I have a number of, of, of investments currently, and I want to even bulk up on those investments because you know what? The last 16 years went by so quickly. I got here 16 years ago, Park Station. I can still smell it. That's how, that's how quickly it goes. The next 16 years are not going to go any slower, but I'm not going to play myself. My future self is not going to say shoulda, woulda, coulda. It's going to say, well done, girl. How am I going to do that? Or how, am I, how have I started doing that, rather? I've been deliberate about my savings. So I don't leave it to chance. I don't say, ah, once, um, if I get paid on the 25th, uh, once I've paid everything, maybe I'll save. No, no, no. Before anything comes off my account, I pay my future self. My mother used to say, back in the day, and I was raised by a single mother. My mother used to say, when I get paid, and then I'm, I want to buy myself some nice Kentucky before um, these debts come and take their money. So same concept for me is, it's not KFC though or any other fast food brand. Mine is, let me pay my future self. Let me take this money, this hard earned money. I work very long hours and I am in a position where I can put something away and I am deliberate about it. So I automate my savings. What do I, how do I do that? I go on the NetBank Money app and I set my savings payments for every single month. Nothing less than what I did the month before, perhaps a little bit more, because that makes it very, very simple. Another thing I do is I categorize my savings into short, medium, and long-term savings. Short-term savings, is that, that's for your proverbial rainy day. If 2020 has taught us anything, or the last 18 months have taught us anything, is that the proverbial rainy day is a real thing. Now, you may not be in a position where you've had to face that in terms of your own finances because maybe you still have parents helping you or not, um, but you've probably seen it around your family. People around you have had to cut down because they have been heavily impacted by, by COVID. Earning ranges in this country have decreased by 20% since 2016, just in the last year. Three, I think almost 3 million jobs were lost in the last 18 months. Earlier, Pam spoke about youth unemployment. So all those statistics are saying we are in the, yeah, we, we are in a bad space. So what does that mean? You've got to put money away for that one thing that you cannot foresee. None of us saw COVID coming. None of us saw lockdowns coming. But the people who survived, whether in business, whether having salary cuts, whether having spouses that have been retrenched or losing their jobs, the people who've been able to kind of survive are the people who had a rainy day nest egg. And that does not mean you have to be rich. You don't have to be rich to save. You've just got to start somewhere. One, then, that's your, then you've got your medium term goals. I don't know about you, but I love to travel. And how I do that is I put money away every single month into a travel fund. And I usually get, a lot, get, get together with some friends and we do this together because I obviously want to travel with my friends. So that for me is a medium term goal. Yours might be buying a house. Yours might be buying a car. Have you thought about that car installment right now? So how about you start saving towards it now so that you've got a great deposit? Or if you think about buying a house, how about you start saving um, that installment every single month so that you can pay for those legal fees and transfer costs? Think about that. And then your long-term savings. Like I said, the last 16 years went by like that. The next 16 are not going to be slower. In the next 25 years, I will be at retirement. 25 years. It's going to go like that as well. One thing that's not going to happen, though, is I'm not going to be a burden on my children. I choose to have a better retirement, and you should be thinking about it too. And you might be thinking, I, I don't know where to start. What are these type of accounts? What do you mean I should put things into various terms and not put my eggs in one basket? What do I do? So if you could go onto um, the NetBank Money app or, or NetBank um, website, you'd be able to see various savings products. I'll talk to a few. The, th the My Pocket account allows you to put money away from your transactional account into the pocket really quickly and you can name every single pocket by your goal. So I have one that says December groceries because I, I need to go home back to Bev's and buy groceries for the people there or Christmas clothes. So in there goes money every single month. 
I also like nice things, Robin. So my, I've also got another one that says nice things for when I do see something nice and I want to spoil myself so it doesn't come off unbudgeted. Another one is a 32-day notice account. So that's where I put my money away for my travels because, I mean, you know, the life must be soft sometimes. And it's softer when it's not on credit. So in there, I have put my money away and I know that I can't touch it. I need to put 32 days notice before I can touch it. Then I have a tax-free account. Now in this account, this, was, this account was introduced by the government around 2015 because they could see that South Africans needed help when it came to savings and to just inculcate that culture of savings within, within the South African context. So whatever money you put in this account, as you know, if you put your money away in an investment account, you're going to earn interest. Now, depending on your tax threshold, you may need to pay tax on the interest that you've earned. This particular account, you pay no tax, okay? The only catch is don't withdraw from it. Keep your money in there because once you've withdrawn, you cannot put that money back in. You've got a 36,000 Rand now since, since this year, 36,000 Rand limit per annum, and that's, per year, that's every year. And then in your lifetime, you can contribute 500,000 Rand. So if I would put this through to you, I think simpler. If I had started 15 years ago, putting 3,000 Rand in that account every single month, I would have reached my 500,000 this um, this year, and if I'd maintained, say, an interest rate of about 8%, I would be sitting at, a, at an investment of a million rand right now just by not touching that, um, that money. And that is the power of compounded interest because whatever I put in earns interest, and if I leave it there, I earn interest on that interest. And when I take that money out one day and I'm retiring, I don't pay a cent on tax. So think about that. You may say to me, I don't have 3,000 Rand to put in every month, and I don't have 36,000 um, every year. Do you have 200? Do you have 500? Do you have 250 Rand? You can start with whatever you have, and you don't have to put in that amount. And the more you earn, the more you go every single year, you can increase that contribution, but you've got to start somewhere. And remember, don't ever touch that investment. And then when I look at my long-term investments, I put my money around in unit trusts, whether unit trusts, ETFs, share tradings, it's up to you. But that's money I'm not going to need anytime soon because that money needs to sit there. You saw last year, if you did, the markets did crash at some point. But those same markets and those same shares are now starting to recover because that's the, the value of time when it comes to investing. And you have time. Use it wisely. If anything, I, once again, 2020 has taught us is that a single stream of income is never enough. So you might be saying, ah, I was making this much money last year and maybe I, I lost my job now. I've got a temp job. What else can I do to kind of make ends meet? Or your spouse has been retrenched and now you're living in a household where you're the only one working or your, or your sister, whoever it is that you're living with. Like, I need to make ends meet. What are you good at? I'm challenging you to write three things that you are, you know, you are hot at. How do people receive those things? And that's possibly your first business plan or the first note of your first business plan. Look at what you're good at. Start yourself a side hustle. Make sure it's not a side hassle, but a side hustle. Make sure that makes you some money. Okay, and we'll be giving you tips around, and around your side hustle hopefully later. But if anything, go on to... Um, simplybiz.co.za, which is powered by NetBank, but not owned by NetBank, where you can go in and get some advice around how you manage a business. And then lastly, I want to talk to you about budgeting. Yeah, the B word, not that B. <laughs> budgeting. You've got to put your money into different compartments, okay? If you just leave your money in your current account and then you become umswape and nandi, you're not going to reach your goals. You're not going to reach your savings goals. You're not going to reach your money goals. So how I look at my budget, I generally chop it up into, I call it the 50, 30, 20 rule. 50% goes to my needs. I need to, I need to eat. I need accommodation. I need to take care of my medical expenses, etc. 30% needs to go to my wants. I mean, I'm going to shop and dine here and there because also you don't want to be miserable, but 20% needs to go to paying yourself first. Whether it's paying off debt and being intentional about it, increasing the amounts that you pay on your loans if you do have any debt, which makes you 
finish that um, debt quicker. And where you have finished one and you've got another one, take this, that, the money that you are paying to this retailer, add it to this retailer. It will help you. And once you're out of that, out of that situation, you can start allocating all that money to your savings and compartmentalize it like we said earlier. And you can do all of this on the NetBank Money app. I hear a lot of people say to me, Sisa, you make this thing sound so simple, but for me it's daunting and I don't even know. I don't even know what, what kind of conversations I have with money. I don't know where to start. I get you. Because you could be like me. Maybe nobody ever talked to you about money. Nobody ever taught you about money. You can go into the Money Edge website, um, powered by NetBank as well, where you can learn how to budget. You can learn the truth about debt, learn how to save, and then where to invest. You can take a, a few quizzes out there and just increase your knowledge because you owe it to yourself. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. And I hope that this savings month, you will have a savings goal that you are going to set, that you are going to back, and that you're going to stick to. Cheers. It was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for making money so practical, so relatable, and not just some taboo concept that you, you can't even understand. Thank you so much, Sisa. I am so happy that she's from Peps. <laughs> <laughs> she just keeps calling it Peps. I have some questions from, uh, uh, for you. Uh, first, I want to go through the comments. People are loving you. Absolutely. Thank you. So this one is, uh, this is making so much financial sense. I'm here for the nice things, <laughs> savings pocket. Me too. I hey actually want to have a nice thing, hey saving now. pocket. I love that. <laughs> I love that because you're really impulsive and you're shopping and you mm. see nice things. Okay. Increase your assets, reduce your liabilities. Liabilities, powerful, CISA. Love it. And those are just some of the comments that you guys are uh, sending through our way. Thank you so much for sending them. We really appreciate it because you guys are also earning points by asking all those questions. So I want to go to uh, the first question that we have is what advice would you give to young people who want to start money conversations with their families who may have not been willing to engage? How can they go about it? This this is a really good question mm. and it's a tough one yes it's a tough one because it's i remember you tough. spoke about it being black love with boundaries 100 percent. that is beautiful and i think i think two things right depending on who you're speaking to in your family if you're talking to your kids it's around that tuck money if i give you 10 rand i want you to save at least one rand mm. that's it mm. start there mm. and i mean you know, whatever you learned when you were young in your mm. formative years, you're kind of still stuck with it, right? Mm. And it'll stick with your kids. Mm. Make them understand the concept of budgeting. I want a PS whatever. I don't, I don't even know which one we're on right now. I mm. heard my nephew going on about he wants this new PS something. And I'm like, with who money? <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got no money. <laughs> and he's like, no, but you work. I'm like, yeah, for me. <laughs> And I said to him, fine, I'll meet you halfway. Mm. All your pocket money, all your birthday money, I need you to put it aside and then I will meet you halfway. Mm. And the only time you're going to have it is when you're serious enough to back yourself. Mm. And that sticks with kids. Mm. Needless to say, he reached his goal. Oh, it, wow. took him, it took him 18 months or oh, wow. around about. It took him a little over a year, but he's reached his goal. And wow. he loves the fact that this is something he did for himself. himself. Okay, barring auntie's help, but he really did <laughs> yes, it for himself. Yes, definitely. And then I'll talk to you about my experiences with talking to people who are older than me. I don't obviously built up these expectations, right? Mm. Particularly with my mom. And it's always been her and I against the world. So for a long time, I was like, ah, I wanted to give my mom everything. I like mm. this concept. And I think it's beautiful. We, yes. we watch our young celebrities buying their mother's houses and whatnot. And that's a similar thing that I wanted to do. But I had to sit down with my mom and be like, okay, this time I'm renovating your house. And this is how much it's going to cost me. This is how long it's going to take me to get this money together. Mm. And you're going to have to be patient. And at first it was hard. But I, even when she tried to call my bluff, she'd be like, oh, but I want this. I'm like, sorry, Miguel, I can't. This is what I'm going mm. to have. This is all I can do. And having those money conversations, because we also like to be, especially as people from 
other provinces. You want to come here and sound like you're living it up, right? Sometimes you actually got to call them and say, you know what? I don't have money this month. I don't ha- I'm not saying help me out, but I just don't have it. Mm. And I think once you're honest with yourself about your budget, it's easier to be honest with other people. Oh, wow. That's really powerful, Cisa. So you have to be honest and just yeah. let them know what can you do and what you cannot do. Yeah. You know, l- uh, manage expectations in that sense. Okay, cool. Let's go to the next questions. How does one save or budget in these difficult times during COVID, especially if you are paying black tax or black love? Oh, I, I love these questions. I think you owe it to yourself and there's no way you're going to do anything in these tough times without budgeting. Mm. There's no other way. So first of all, you need to be, I call it being naked with yourself when Mm -hmm. you're being naked with your finances, right? You have to look at what you've been spending. So if you look at perhaps even pre-COVID or pre the, your circumstances changing, Mm. look at your three months bank statement because it won't lie. (laughs) It won't lie, (laughs) you know? And whether it's a, it's a coffee that costs you 32 rand a day, that you're now no longer um, buying and you're making coffee at home, what's happening to that 32 rand? That's the 32 rand that needs to be allocated to something else Mm. like a saving. If you've saved on petrol, for instance, because you're not driving to work, what's happening to that? And you won't even understand where your money is going unless you budget. So that's the first thing. You need to understand where your money is going. And if you have less money to go around, you need to be practical about what you can and cannot pay. You still have to service your debt. But if you need to go into a debt arrangement with whoever is applying your debt or with your Mm. bank, you need to contact them first before you default. Contact them and say, you know what, I used to pay you guys 500 rand a month. Now I can only do 250. Obviously, you're not going to not pay. But say, I can only do 250. What debt consolidation plan can you help me mm. with, right? And, and that conversation, if you're living with people who are depending on you, it, this is the time to take your, the, your pay slip or your budget and show them. I get 100 rand. Out of this 100 rand, 10 rand goes to this, 20 rand goes to this. To, and it manages expectations, even children. You will find your children doing things differently because you're honest with them. Remember Mm. what I said, the conversations were never had. You have to have the conversations. Amazing. I think for me, the last question I want to ask you in terms of our salaries and uh, because most of these people are watching are probably like in their first year or second year of employment or third year of employment. How do you raise the conversation about getting a raise? Because obviously, people are losing jobs, you're taught to be grateful for the job that you have at the moment. The fact that you have a job, you should be grateful for, but you are seeing the petrol hikes, the food hikes, and you've tried to kind of reduce your lifestyle to whatever it is now, but you're still finding yourself in this position where you're like, I'm actually struggling a bit because my salary has stayed the same or has reduced due to the uh, pandemic. How do you then start the conversation with your employer to say, I actually need more money? Or do you then say, it's tough times, let me and be understanding to the business, let me just go find myself a side gig or whatever the case may be? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. It's a funny mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. because I'm an employee, but I'm also a boss. <laughs> so I'm trying to think. <laughs> Where, from <laughs> which perspective do you kind of answer that question from? I want to be honest. So <laughs> yes. I think it's a bit of both, Pam. Um, I think one of the first lessons you need to learn is to manage your own money. Yes. It's not your employer's fault that you don't know how to manage your money. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. You've got to put in your work. I always say, do the work Mm -hmm. and the results will speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. People who work are remunerated. People who work are promoted. Mm -hmm. People who go the extra mile are the people who are um, recognized by businesses. And I'm Mm -hmm. talking about formal businesses who possibly very well established, established, et cetera. So you've got to put in the work. Mm -hmm. Nobody owes you anything. You're here to do the best that you can do. That is one. Mm -hmm. And if you know that that's what you're doing, Mm. then it's easier to have a conversation Conversation. about your worth. Yes. For instance, if you are in my team, you're underperforming and you want to talk to me about money. Hey man, (laughs) ain't none my business. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But if I know that Pam is a sterling employee 
and I can see what is happening, I will probably initiate that raise without you even saying mm. anything, right? But you've got to put in the work. Um, that's one. And if you're in a position where you've had a salary cut, like I was saying earlier, because a lot of companies are going through mm. a tough time. And I'm talking about huge private companies. They are going through a tough time. Um, it's important for you to look at the things you're good at. Start something on the side. Make sure that you understand what you're doing. There is a need for it. Make sure that it's making you money. Make sure that you separate that money from your own money so that you can understand that is this thing really making money or not? And you don't overspend your business finances. Mm. But start something on the side that will help you. Also, guys, you know, one stream of income is not a sustainable thing. I think Warren Buffett says, if you have one income, you are one salary away from poverty. You and the guy on the street oh. are a month or two apart. That's it. So you've got to, whether you're earning all the bucks that you want, think about other avenues of making money. Mm. I heard a rabbi once say that nobody can fill cups that aren't there. Ooh. Amazing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we wrap up this uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Sisa. You. you were absolutely amazing. Appreciate Thank you so much. Thank Please you. keep doing what you do and educating uh, uh, people about money because it's really important conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, the leaderboard is looking rather tense. Let me show you guys. Um, yeah, so our leading lady, I've seen her questions. So I do attest that this leaderboard is absolutely correct. I think her name is Doze or Dose Amosi. Uh, I am so sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. And then we also have uh, Tundukani uh, Baloi on the number two spot with 125 points. At number three, we have Timbisa Sikwebu at 121 points. Beauty Matebula at 110 points. Girl at number eight. Please do the right things. Upload a profile picture, ask a question, like a question, interact in order to ensure that you kick Tsundugani from that number two spot at least. Remember to visit the unlock.me website to get the latest on Youth X News, blogs, upcoming events, and more. Visit www.unlock.me, click on the potential, and learn more about careers, how to unlock your side hustle, how to unlock your next big career, break through helpful hints to help you climb that ladder. Nedbank is committed to creating a platform for the youth to have constructive conversations about money and opportunities that lead to sustainable growth during these unprecedented times. And you are invited to take a front row seat and witness the power panel. Introducing our change maker for fashion and beauty, Rich Mnisi, head of retail investments at Nedbank, Sisandi Lekikito. Our local changemaker, Alandi Wekama, and finally, our panel facilitator, Abigail Fisahi. The floor is yours. Welcome everyone, so excited to have you all together in one room. <laughs> Rich, I'm going to start with you. You just okay. recently launched an amazing um, new line, uh, the Pride Collection. Yes. Talk us through that. Um, so with that collection, um, we wanted to hero the minorities and communities that uh, gave us the rights that we have today. And we also wanted to shine a light on allyship. So the black and white in the collection represents basically straight people that are allies to the LGBTQIA plus community so that they're also proud and they can also 
use their voice to, I don't know, spread knowledge and, you know, expose their friends and family about basically the community and how just it shouldn't matter to people yeah. um, who you want to love. And I don't know, it's just a matter of like, I think people like um, putting things in proximity to themselves and it's mm. not about you, it's about me. And I think it's just... The collection is dedicated to that. Well, it's a stunning collection. Thank you, thank you Lancy, so much. Lancy, you're also in the fashion and beauty space as a content creator. Mm -hmm. How did you get into this space and what inspired you? Um, I'd like to say the space pursued me ah. because in terms of social media, you just post out of enjoying creating content and looking beautiful and, you know, and then eventually brands started catching on to it. And if they enjoy how you create content out of your own joy, then if you get paid for it, you're probably going to put in even more efforts into it. So it started off as just a personal thing and then slowly but surely started getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm here today. Mm. Lovely. Sis, I'm going to come to you uh, in a minute. I just want to hear from Rich and Lanzi. When it comes to starting your own fashion label, Rich, what are some of the financial struggles or challenges that you experienced in the very beginning? I mean, once you find that little capital, you just don't know where to put it first. Yeah. I think that's the, the, you know, you don't know whether you're buying fabric or you're investing in a computer or you're buying, buying a machine or it, it, that's the tricky part. I think it's like knowing where to start. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was buying machines and then finding someone who will use those machines and so from them. So it, it's always different for different people. Um, there's a lot of, I think now people are starting to use uh, CMTs and outsourcing their production. So they go to... Uh, houses that uh, facilitate production and you just instruct them on how you want to make something. So it depends on how you want to structure your label. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Lanzi, like Rich said, it is different for different people. So what mm -hmm. were your challenges as a content creator? I think for me, the challenge was because the the money that we get is very inconsistent. Yeah. So some months are better than other months. So it's kind of learning how to budget and knowing what to do with your money because the first check is very exciting and you want to go out with your friends but then you have bills to pay at the end of the month and then you also want to fit in with the other creators and buy a rich amnesi outfits hey. but it's like that's not where you are yet so <laughs> I, I think it's just <laughs> so i think it's just like disciplining yourself in terms of learning finances and then you'll have fun later mm -hmm. sisa this is a, a very important question for young business men business women content creators as well where do i start with my little um capital that i've managed to gather together what is my first step when starting a business so I think it's important, um, Abigail, to get into a community of business people also, right? Um, whether you find yourself a mentor or you just join a, a, a crew of business people and learn from their mistakes. Um, there's a Tosa saying, it's mm. meaning those who have walked ahead of you are the ones that you should actually be getting um, guidance from. So that's, I think, the first thing. Secondly, I think you need to teach yourself about the things you don't know. A lot of... Um, business people are that way incidentally. You started off as a creative or you start off because you can't get employment, mm -hmm. not necessarily because you understand business. Mm -hmm. So understand that in business, you are going to be the, you're, if you're a one man show, you are going to be the accountant, you are going to be the marketer, you are going to be the creative, you are going to be um, the HR person if you have another person that works for you. So educate yourself about labor laws, educate yourself about tax, educate yourself about budgeting, and also put to paper something that you respect. Mm -hmm. So when they say business plan, I've seen some amazing business plans and I've seen some shoddy proposals mm -hmm. because also I think people think whatever's in your head, people understand. Mm -hmm. So make sure that um, this is something that is eloquent, that is eligible, that can be read by people and actually take it seriously and make sure that you understand the, your, your market. Who are you doing this for? Mm -hmm. Who are you supplying this for, to? Who are you selling this to? And once you've got that, I think then you've got a, then you can start thinking about, okay, now I've got the capital, what do I do? I yeah. think there are a couple of steps long before you get capital. And what, what would you say or advise as some of the services that NetBank has available for young entrepreneurs to sort of dive into and use as a startup or to springboard them into maintaining a business? So there's the unlock.me platform where you are, um, you do have access obviously to our change makers and to various other business people. I'd also direct um, 
people to the uh, Simply Biz um, website, which is simplybiz.co.za. On there, you can find mentors, you can find access to funding. And when I say access to funding, I'm not saying you're going to click and the net bank's going to give you a loan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, obviously, there are those options, but that's not all you can consider as a young entrepreneur, right? I say to people all the time that 100% of nothing is nothing. Mm. So you may consider also selling bits of your business to someone. So over there, you also get ac you, you'll get access to venture capitalists or angel investors or even crowd funders mm. who may want to then own a part of your business and then work mm. out what works for you. On that platform, you also have access to various markets. So you can take whatever product that you have or service that you have and post it on there and find someone who's perhaps looking for what you're looking for. And there's also a community of entrepreneurs. There is also a business coaching service. And as well, you're able to um, register your business at CIPC and not pay the thousands of whatever that you have to pay with certain people. And a lot of advice, guys, because you need the advice and the exposure to other people. Yeah. Lindsay, as a, as a content creator, Creator, were you open to asking for advice? Is it something that came naturally to you? Because I know that for me, for example, I'm not someone who goes out there and mm. says, please, can you help me? Yeah. But I've learned that over time, this is, this is something that you need. So how do you manage that as a content creator? I think the mistake I made in the beginning was underestimating the digital space. Mm. I thought it was easy based on how I did it. So just taking a picture, posting it, caption hashtag i didn't know there's things like a rates card media kits there's agencies and also i looked at other influencers as our competitors so it was kind of like how do i keep up with you how do i do the same thing and then i found myself being very confused mm -hmm. and not knowing what i'm doing so i think eventually i was like you actually have to ask other creatives so if i went to events i wasn't shy of being like Hey, so I saw you start this. How did you do it? Who are you speaking to to get this campaign? When you send a proposal, how do I word it? So I think it's very important to ask other creatives. I didn't. Mm. And I think I wasted a good two years in the game mm. thinking I know it all. Yeah. Um, and you really don't. Even if you study it, you never know it all. 100%. Mm. Rich, for you, uh, were you the type of person to reach out and ask <coughs> for advice? Were you the type of person to say, listen, I need help. How do I do this? Yeah, I mean, when I was in school, I used a lot of that time to work for other people, do internships, and, 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 and you learn so much. I think sometimes, even if it's not asking a question, just watching someone, you just see the things that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I remember just interning at some places, and I'm like, I would never treat my employees the way you're treating your employees. You know, you learn yeah. little things like that as well. So it's definitely, if you're not good at asking, watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, because yeah. also people do get anxiety about like, you know, reaching out and I think it stops them from, you know, pursuing that they dream. So if that's not for you, then just watch people yeah. and you'll learn as much. I love that. If you're not good at asking, then watch. watch. Um, Cesar, I'm going to come back to you. You spoke in your um, earlier, you said that, you know, we don't have a culture of saving and we don't have a culture of talking about money and educating ourselves on these things. Why do you think that is and how do we break those boundaries? Whoa, I think because we also come from, and I don't know about you, but we come, I come, my background is very secretive. And we were mm. having a conversation <laughs> earlier <laughs> <laughs> about, 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 about the things that um, the people who came before us, like the secrets about mm. everything. Mm. You know what mm. I mean? It's mm. like, it's not a very open conversation. And um, we come, I think that's just our culture. Things are, things are not spoken about. Money is your business. I always challenge people when they say money is not a touchy subject. I'm like, okay, so how much do you earn? Mm. Why can't we start? Now we're touching the wrong thing. And then it's like, <laughs> you know? So I think, I, think, I think naturally that's it. And also I think we also come from a very complicated history as South Africans mm. where a lot of us were have-nots, you know? Mm. And being a have-not, coming into a have space also has been frowned upon, you know? So it's always, and we also have a bit of a culture of I want to do it first and I want to be the only one because of that have-not mm. have mentality. Mm. Yeah. So it's very difficult for me to then say, because I've made it, yes, Rich, don't do this, man. Do it like this, you know? Because mm. you, you want to be... And I always say this, I say this to, to, to some of my mentees, if you're the only person at the table, you're at the wrong table. Mm. Mm. Wow. Mm. And that's the thing, whether, whether a person of color or not, I'm just saying, if you're the only woman or the only black person, there's no time for that anymore. So I think it's very important for us to have 
real conversations. And I always say you don't, you can't give what you don't have, right? Mm. So you can't have an honest conversation with Lindsay about money when you're not having it with yourself. Hundred percent. So I think it's 100%. important to stay yourself down and challenge yourself to teach your kids differently, teach your friends differently, challenge yourself to say, you know what, guys, I can't afford to go out this week, mm-hmm. and be like, sorry, guys, I'm dizzy. Mm. And I think that's it. something that a lot of people are hesitant to say. Yeah. You know, your friends are going out mm. tonight. Yeah. You want to be with them, but you don't have I'm the sorry, money. I'm sorry, I can't do it and it starts from there and so you'll find that another friend will be like Ish, guys has even me mm. and someone will probably end up saying actually come to my house <laughs> let me chill. host bring a bottle of wine i'll cook yes and it's and it's completely changed and you still have that catch up obviously 100%. after level level yes COVID. when you're allowed yes, when you're allowed to, <laughs> when you're allowed to be level, outside level. <laughs> rich how about you did you grow up uh, around a culture of saving and and money management no, I grew up around people that had debt. I think <laughs> a lot of debt. I think that's why, like, it's so crazy. Even now, like, for me to get anything, I have to motivate so much because mm. I just don't want debt whatsoever. Yeah. I was even listening to your talk and that there's good debt and bad debt. But for me, I was so traumatized by it that I was like, I don't want anything. If mm. I can buy it cash, I'm not going to do it. Um, because I grew up around that environment and people, you know, like... Someone owing an account from Edgar's from 10 years ago and it's 2009 and it's just like a thing that follows you around forever. So I yeah. think, I don't know, there's trauma for me when it comes to money. Yeah, I think for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. And what I liked about Cesar's chat earlier was that nice things account. How was that mm-hmm. nice things oh, account? Really I was like, that. okay, that's my favorite one. <laughs> I like nice things. <laughs> Lancy, for you, um, did you grow up around a culture of saving? No, I think with black families, we all know like the Edgar's accounts, the <laughs> Ackerman's accounts, <laughs> the eggs, the one upon me, like we all grew up around that. So I think you learn it. They don't even teach it in school, which yeah. I think they should start doing because you get into adult world and you're like, what is this? So I think growing up, I saw the like rummaging and like getting phone calls on the house phone. Like we're looking for to pay and it's like why is this happening and i think oh, right. it's not their fault they also weren't educated themselves oh, right. and i think that it helps that now we all speaking amongst ourselves whereas they our parents they didn't speak about money amongst themselves so i think things like this help so you know actually it's not embarrassing to have debts just know how, how to, to manage, manage it how and, to manage yeah. yes rich <laughs> <laughs> this is a Trauma. joke no but like just to, just to add on what you said you know like it's so funny that like someone would open a Fushini account or something and just so that we can buy a new outfit for the next funeral. Because black people are obsessed with showing up yeah. and then you can't show yeah. up in the same outfit yeah. and then, yeah. And yeah. then you get into debt just based on like, you know, wanting to look good at every single event, which yeah. will happen every single weekend, yeah. which is crazy. crazy. Yeah. yeah. See, so let's, let's chat to that point that Rich made, you know, being obsessed with showing up and, and having the latest this and that and the other. A lot of people can say, okay, you know what? Let me, let me get a credit card. Mm-hmm. It is available to me. What would you say to, to young people who are looking to go in that direction? Is it something that you should look at mm-hmm. when you're just starting out? Is a credit card something that you would advise? So I don't think, like I said, there's a lot of, credit that's not bad Mm -hmm. you know i think a credit card in itself is not bad okay me on a credit card though (laughs) (laughs) not gonna work (laughs) i just think your 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 mentality shouldn't change because you have a credit card and you think that you've got unlimited access to everything okay In, in in actual fact you should have a credit card when you're able to pay off what you spend every single month before the interest charge goes off okay right and that's how you use a credit card You put, because also a lot of bank points, like your reward systems and whatnot, are linked to your credit cards then. So, if you're smart, you can take, use your credit card. When when your salary comes in, you can hoi it into the credit card. Okay. So that you don't have that interest that is building Mm. up. Also, a credit card is a, for me, it's a nice to have for when I do have things that, like something comes up and like, oh, I need to just quickly do this. I pay, I pay it with this. But month, at the end of the month, it's going in there. And that's if... I can't touch a certain savings account that has mm. been there. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I think credit card should never be 
a substitute for you saving and using your money wisely i think it can be bad especially in this showing up world in this um social media world in this soft life world mm -hmm. <laughs> i think you be, you best you can be caught with your pants down and find yourself in a very sticky situation yeah. if you're out here with seven credit cards you're paying robbing peter to pay paul because mm -hmm. um, that happens you take from this credit card in order to pay this credit card and then that to pay that i think that is a, a, a very terrible web and it's very difficult to get out of. Yeah. So I think as a basic, don't also take um, limit increases unnecessarily. If your credit card hypothetically is 5,000, you know that, you know what, I don't, I can't afford anything more than 5,000, leave it at that. Okay. And you know that that's, that that's the access that you got and you've got, you can pay it off every single time. Awesome. I think that's the concept with revolving credit in general. Okay, understood. Let's switch gears, Lanzi, um, with regards to finding brands to collaborate with as a content creator. Mm -hmm. Obviously, once your followers are up, brands start reaching out to you. Yeah. They start telling you this is how much our budget is. How do you navigate that space when it comes to what it is that you deserve to be paid mm -hmm. and what a client's budget is? How do you go around maneuvering it's that? It's very difficult in terms of rates because sometimes it's a creative, like I said earlier, in terms of the inconsistent money. Um, you can sometimes accept a campaign even though you know they're underpaying you, but because you're rushing to pay for something, you kind of just have to prioritize your bills. Okay. But then I think sometimes you have to remember, if you want to last long in this industry and prioritize longevity, you have to make a decision based on, is this a brand I want to work with? Do I want to be associated with this brand? Because brands speak to each other. So if they're having their own meeting and they say, oh, Lindsay worked with NetBank, then they can be like, oh, that's great. Let me work with her, whereas it could be a brand where they're like, that doesn't align. And now you paid your rent, but now you've fumbled another bag yeah. because they're speaking to each other. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult when it comes to that. I think just go with your gut feeling, go with whatever you feel is right at the time. I don't think there's a bad decision you yeah. learn as you go. Um, in terms of working with brands, you can send proposals. Um, if you feel like you align with the brand, you can tell them. Okay. And they feed off your confidence as well to say, oh, you really think you can work with us? And you give them your rates. Don't Just because you're bringing up the idea doesn't mean you should now make it less amounts. Okay. Charge them the same. You gave them the idea for free. Sure. So I think just trust yourself. I mm. think that's literally what it is. So, so what do you sort of take as a content creator? What do you take into consideration when you, when you create your rate card? When you say, okay, I'm worth X amount of money. Is it your, the amount of followers you have, your mm. experience as a content creator? What do brands look at? Um, first thing is engagement and insights. So when you send through your media kits, you should can have followers. I always say followers doesn't equal influence. You could have okay. 200,000 followers and then only one person is going to buy the thing that you posted. You could have 60,000 and then 40,000 of them are like, oh my gosh, it's how you carry yourself mm -hmm. and create the content. So I think what brands first look at is your influence. Sure. Hence, there's micro influences, there's macro influences, there's nano. The influence is broad. I think people mistake popularity for influence and it's, it's not the same thing. Okay. So I think with when you want to enter the industry, don't focus on followers. And a lot of people are like, they'll dear me, like, I don't have a lot of mm. subscribers or followers, but I want to work with brands. I'm like, go for it. There's space for everyone. And brands don't want to seem too linear at the moment. They don't want to make it seem like we only work with luxury influencers or we only work with nano influencers. They're just trying to include everyone because sure. i think it's become more of a popular space yeah definitely mm. especially now with quarantine and lockdown yeah. so many people are working from their homes and, mm. and recording content from home rich mm. earlier you you chatted um about making sure that your brand um, is perceived and it looks a certain way how much of that influences then how much you charge for a product as a business owner how do you sort of measure that scale and find a place uh, for us, we do things fairly, to be honest, like it's literally from raw materials to, 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 like it's, it's not like a thumbs up, which people think it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, there's so many things that go to even one garment, it's like beyond the materials, then there's production of it, then there's packaging, then there's cleaning it, then, then goes into marketing from the photo shoot, the models, like all those things need to be factored in mm. because you would never had seen that garment if it wasn't on that model in that shoot, like things like that. So you just have to factor in everything. Um, actually, speaking of money, like I remember this one time I sold a bag and people think like, 
a 32,000 rand bag to a store in London. And of that purchase, um, as a brand, we only made 1,000 rand. Really? Because we calculated everything wrong from customs to, to, and to that is your packaging, loss. all those things. We calculated everything wrong and we made a thousand rand. And it just wow. goes to show you that like money isn't, sure. yeah. even though it's a number, it's, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. need to understand what goes into that number. Yeah. Rich, yeah. We've, we've seen you trend on social media a few times, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the most recent one you remember. But I remember there was a time um, you had a, I think it was a skirt for 60,000 and, and yes. South Africans had yeah. so much to say. How do you sort of manage those sort of chats and those sort of discussions where people feel like 60K for a Rich Munisi skirt is a bit hectic? To be honest, I'm so fortunate because like I think Twitter is so beautiful because there's the person that starts the conversation will probably disagree. And then there's everyone else who can see uh, where things are going or where things should go and then they expand on the conversation for you. Even for me, sometimes I would read th things and I was like, oh, actually, you're right. I didn't think of that, but you're right. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that's how I handle it. I just read it and keep quiet. I Also, I think with social media, you have to protect your energy. So mm -hmm. I don't engage as much um, just for my mental health because it is very overwhelming. So like for me, I use the internet to like, research post and go <laughs> like yeah i don't necessarily <laughs> stay there yeah because it's quite toxic yeah um, it can to be honest it can yeah be. see so, so we've heard now from from rich and lanzi as a as a business owner as a content creator you know there are challenges in this thing there are challenges when it comes to starting your own business there are challenges as a content creator um what sort of services does netbank have for people who want to start businesses um and for for that to show them the way so I mentioned earlier the Simply Blizz platform, and, I, and, and the reason why I keep talking about it, I, I'm sure I sound like a preacher preaching to the <laughs> choir here, but uh, I'm so passionate about it because one, it's, it's, it may be backed by NetBank, but you're not going to go on there and then be sold NetBank products, right? It's really there to just empower people. Okay. Um, it's really there to connect people to mentors, um, to, to, to access to information. I was chatting to, on another panel to youth impl uh, entrepreneurs and they said like the little things that they don't know how to access, they don't mm -hmm. know how to talk about um, angel investors or who to even speak to. Where do I go when I'm looking for a venture capitalist to invest in my, in my company or invest yeah. in my dream? I don't even know where to, where to go, you know, because a loan is actually not your only option. And when people think that they, that they, that 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 is the only option. So I think that that's a, 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 an amazing platform and you can access it online or you can go into a NetBank branch and ask about it. Sure. Um, I think also outside of NetBank, you need to, I, I said it earlier to Pam, that you've got to back yourself. You've got to, you have got to put yourself in it completely. So learn, if you want to learn how to code, you can learn how to code on YouTube. If you if you want to learn how to do, th you you can find the information. Just put yourself out there and keep mm. looking. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so why should I invest or, or save my money using a a bank like NetBank instead of just saying you know what I'm going to shove my money under my mattress every month and that's how I'm going to save? What sort of benefits are there when in banking? <laughs> you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this story. <laughs> of this granny and she was in my family oh <laughs> it's, a, it's a family story <laughs> she put money under the mattress and the rats ate it <laughs> okay so that's yeah. one reason <laughs> so that's one reason when, when paper money was still like coming out yeah. the rats were in there so one reason <laughs> is the rats <laughs> <laughs> and also the only way uh, money under a mattress is gonna go is it's gonna go flatter because you're gonna keep taking out of it mm -hmm. human nature guys Pr i always say protect your money but firstly even to business people, protect your business, protect it from yourself. Yeah. Because you actually don't need help messing up your life, eh? <laughs> and especially your financial life. You need, no, nobody needs to help you do that. You can do it all on your own. So protect your money from yourself. You are not a, you, you're not special. You're not going to think about it differently. Warren Buffett takes his money and invests it for a reason. Warren Buffett decides I'm not going to buy a new car for a reason, takes that money and, and puts it into stocks for a reason. Because he knows if he leaves it there, he's going to use it. Mm. Another thing that I would say, put your money away. I, I, was, I was reading an economist journal the other day, and, he's, and, and they were speaking about um, inflation, the impact of inflation um, 
obviously every other year we see an, a rise in prices and but not a rise in money the question i got earlier what happens to my salary when it stays the same and that's exactly what happens mm -hmm. 1983 a burger at a big fast food burger joint was anything from three to four rand that's a cheeseburger with extra what what four rand what a time. At the same franchise. <laughs> what a time. At the same franchise, 2021, the same burger. Actually, the burger is smaller. Yeah. Probably mm. less meat, less everything in it. And the meat is probably not even the same quality. Yeah. Um, is now almost 80 rand. Sure. It's the same place. It's the same type of food. You have the same 100 rand. But that 100 rand in, in 1983 would have bought you something, more. would have bought you more burgers than now. Yeah. So that's the concept of making your money work for you, right? If your money is in a current account or just chilling there and not earning interest, you are wasting your money. That same money is not going to be worth the same thing next year. Mm -hmm. You guys have seen the, like the rise in food prices in the last year, right? So what, what you could buy with a thousand rand for groceries, it's not the same. Like the bags are less. Do you know what I mean? 100%. So the only way to make sure that your thousand rand is the thousand rand of tomorrow in 10 years is if you invest it and you put it away. So if your money is not earning interest while you are sleeping, you are wasting your money. Mm -hmm. so, so what is then the key difference, if any, between saving your money and investing your money? Are there any key differences between the two? Not really. Okay. I find that the terms are used inter interchangeably. Okay. And the concept of putting money away, is sa you can decide to save. Some people say saving is more short term. And I, that's, I think, the more colloquial kind of language. If I want to take my money and put it in a pocket, I'm saving. Or if I'm putting it into a 32-day notice account, I'm saving. But if I'm investing, maybe I'm putting it away for five years in a fixed deposit or I'm putting it in unit trust. Whatever you're doing, both concepts, you can earn money off your money. Okay. I just say... Make sure whether you call it saving, investing, heck, paying your future <laughs> self. <laughs> Make sure you do Make it. Make sure your money is earning money. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Lance, if you could go back to, to when you started your, your channels and, and started creating your content, mm -hmm. looking back at everything that you've learned so far, if there's one thing that you wish you knew before you knew it, mm -hmm. what would that be? One. <laughs> okay, a couple. <laughs> <laughs> one. Um, I'd say the first thing is, Ask people, like I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. figuring out by myself, big no. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, but then looking at others, like, you're doing so well. Why am I not? But it's like, because you probably asked someone. Mm -hmm. So I think definitely trying to do it by myself. Um, the second thing is being authentic. Um, I wanted to, I looked at other influencers and creatives and YouTubers and I was like, I want to do it like that. Mm. You're getting views. Then when I do it, it's not as receptive because consumers see right through you if you're trying to be someone else or you're just trying to get the views or trying to get the campaign out there. So I think I would have changed me being authentic sure. because when I, the minute I decided to be myself, that's literally where my content just skyrocketed. Yeah, Love so that. Those are the two things I'd say 100% of yeah. a change. Yeah. And, and what would you say to content creators watching at home who thinks, you know what, I need this fancy camera that costs thousands of mm. rands. I need the lighting. I need the this, that, and the other. Did you have all of those assets when you, when you started? Definitely not. I filmed my first YouTube vlog on my phone. It was an iPhone 6, I think, on my phone. I edited on Windows, Window Player. And then like with music, I just put South African music. I got copyrighted, but I didn't care. So then as time went on, I then did research. I was like, oh my gosh, cameras are so expensive. But if you take your time and you do the content, you're going to make money from it and then use that money to buy quality things. So sure. you kind of have to be patient, put in the work to increase the quality of your work because no one's going to hand you a camera you can't not create the content waiting for a camera just do it it'll buy itself if yeah. you just do the work yeah and also what do you what do you then say to content creators who want to get into youtube to be monetized who want to make money when you started on youtube was that your vision did you say listen i want to be able to make an extra source mm -hmm. of income from from youtube or was it just organic for you when i started youtube i didn't even know we could make money from youtube i did it because I just liked it. Um, I used to watch a lot of YouTubers. Then as time went, I was like, okay, I can make a little bit of Action. money from this. <laughs> so then obviously I put in more effort. So the first thing I like to say to people who want to join the YouTube space specifically, don't do it for the money. Okay. Because it's going to take a very long time for you to make money that is even 
you know so you have to do it just because you want to do it so that when the money comes in you're just like oh there it is that's great but you're not like where's the money because it'll demotivate you as well okay. if you like where's the money then it doesn't come then you're like why am i even filming another video so mm. don't do it for the money it'll come but it takes i've been on youtube for five years and i'd say the only time i started making money where i could see it was two years ago Okay. Uh, three years was just me doing it because I wanted to do it. Only for the past two years, I'm like, okay, there's a cute little buck that Amazing. I can use. But that's what I say. <laughs> so, so how does that entire monetization process then work, work as a YouTuber? So people watch your ads and the more ads they watch, that's the money that you make. Okay. Um, but you have to have a minimum of a thousand follow, I mean, subscribers. So once you have a thousand subscribers, you get monetized and then YouTube sends you a pin that you put into your YouTube basically to verify that it's you because sure. anyone would just take your money. And then from there, the more videos you make, obviously the more ads watched and then the more money that you make. Amazing. So, yeah. And you've been doing amazing on, on both YouTube and Instagram. Thank you, so I congratulations. Have. Thank you. It's amazing to see and to <laughs> Thank watch. Thank you so much. Rich, if you could go back to your, your younger self and when you started <sighs> out in the, in the industry, what is that one piece of advice that you learned along the way, but you wish you knew from the beginning? Take your time. Um, yeah, time is such a precious thing. You learn so much from time. Um, I mean, even for me, like, I started the brand straight off graduating, so I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about SARS. I was like, who is SARS? Why is she calling me? And you should know. That's one thing you should know. <laughs> it was one of the, I'm like, who gave you my number? <laughs> So it's time is such a beautiful thing because you can learn from so many people. I think that's what I wish I did. Um, but I also did it. So I, there's a double edged sword here because I also went into it and learned. But I know that like it wouldn't have been easy if it wasn't for my support structure who, you know, supported me to keep doing what I do. Mm -hmm. So I think if you don't have that luxury, I think allow time to teach you. 100%. and to give you knowledge and money and things and all those mm -hmm. things. <laughs> and, and, and talking about that support structure, Rich, you said that you, your company currently employs seven people or you're a seven, um, te seven member team. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, to paying your, your staff and paying your support structure, talk to me about those conversations because as a new business owner, yes, I'm going to be the accountant and the CEO and all of this from in the very beginning, but once I am able to employ people, what sort of steps do I take to make sure that I'm doing the right things here? Um, for me, I didn't employ anyone until I could, um, which was very recent. And, um, and that's where I started, because in the beginning I had one employee and then stopped that because I realized that like, I don't necessarily know, like I think a lot of people saw now with the pandemic, people are applying for UIF, mm. the employee didn't register, they were, you know, all those things and people didn't have money, it was so crazy. Um, so that's something I realized when I started the brand in 2015. So I think now when it was time to employ people, it was making, I had conversations with my staff. I needed to know what their needs are because I also working with, um, you know, third party suppliers is that you start seeing, like, I, I once asked this one lady how much it takes for her to travel. And she's like, she lives in Kempton Park, but she works, um, in Linden and she spends like 2.5 uh, for transport Just but she only transport. gets paid 5,000 I was like guys <laughs> that's half of her salary yeah it doesn't make sense um, so I needed to have a conversation with my staff um, and I think that goes back to working from an ethical point of view because 100%. that then informed where the clothing goes so the more time the more the staff works in a happy environment the better quality they create the more that garment th it's, it's worth more because it's made better and that goes into that so it wasn't a matter of you know shortchanging people for their talent people are just people just work so under so much pressure and i think once you give people the opportunity to work comfortably you can like that's where the opportunity comes and then the business starts growing and you're like if i was shortchanging everyone and robbing everyone yeah you wouldn't it wouldn't be here today 100%. you know things like that so it's I don't know, it was just a matter of like consultation. I think that's how I handled it, mm. but I know people handle yeah. it differently. Sure. So sitting down and having open and honest conversation with the people yeah. that you employ. 
Sure. See, sir, uh, as someone who has financial experience and, and who's, who's knowledgeable on these things, you know, looking at your younger self and the financial decisions that you made back then, what sort of knowledge, <laughs> and we heard it earlier, Ooh, what sort of knowledge or, or tips and tricks do you yeah. wish you had known then that you know now? You know, Rich said a, a very powerful thing. Give time time. Mm. You know, I think we get onto these social media platforms and we want everything now. We want, every, like with this microwave generation, we want, you want to be able to afford the nicest weave now, the nicest car now. So I think that also plays on our mentality and, and really deters us from really planning for the future because mm -hmm. there is actually a future. Mm -hmm. There is time. You know, so if I could if I could have a conversation with myself 16 years ago, it would be there's time and in this time, you've got to make sure it works for you and not just today and how things look, but how things really are. So I think for me, it's the psychology first of saying you're enough. Mm. You don't have to do things and buy cars to impress people you don't even like, mm. you know, mm. and who are not going to like you because of the car either. So <laughs> you're you're enough. That's the first thing I would really tell myself. And then secondly, I would challenge myself to say, what are you doing for CISA tomorrow? You know, um, whether it's I, I, I'm planning a holiday and I make sure that this thing is cash. I, I, I look at the amount of money that I've had come through my account or come through me in my life. And it's embarrassing when I look back. I'm like, you know, it's like, I could have done so much better, With that man, yeah. right? So I think for me, I would have set some goals for myself mm -hmm. because I think goals, are, they really kind of channel and direct your thoughts, right? Um, Lancy said you get onto this, like this um, content creation platform and you decide to be a content creator first. You decide that this is what you want to do. It's not about the money that comes in or how much of it comes in or whether you've got the right camera. Similarly, in your life, you need to decide that I am going to have x and i am going to set up this goal or i'm going to have a car that is going to be um fully paid up i am going to have a couch that i don't um, buy on credit whatever it is so you set those goals and then you decide on those goals and everything else goes to those goals and i'm not saying be so stingy to yourself that now you i you can't wear things so you're not <laughs> nice or whatever but i think it's very important to understand your nice things wallet mm -hmm. and your must-haves wallet mm -hmm. and your future self wallet so i think for me it's setting those goals and 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 deciding like rich said earlier that he decided not to be in debt you know I, I look at him like, oh, I wish that I had made that decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really do. I wish I had made that decision early on in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, then I wouldn't have gotten trapped up in a lot of things that now in my 30s, I'm like, oh, I've recovered yeah. and I'm doing better, but I'd be so much further. If I so hadn't, try and yeah. live your life without that kind of regret mm -hmm. and ask yourself the question, your future self. Is your future self going to say shoulda, woulda, coulda? Or is your future self going to say well done? Mm. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Rich, we know that you steered away from debt. Um, but are there, <laughs> any, are there any financial decisions that you made personally or, or <coughs> with regards to your business that you look back and you think, man, why did I do that? Every I two months. Done <laughs> <laughs> every two months. Oh. <laughs> no, every two months. I'm not going to lie to you. No. <laughs> every two months. Okay. Yeah, but I think... <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to elaborate on this? But it teaches you. It teaches it you. know, nice sometimes thing? it's like, yeah, <laughs> no. Not, not the of nice course. thing. <laughs> <laughs> what else? <laughs> 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 no, I think, but you know, it's like, yeah, two ways. I, I, I learn from it also because, like, the next time I won't yeah. do as much or I won't do it, or you realize that you feel emba embarrassed. I think sometimes you need that embarrassment yeah. because it informs what you do next. Yeah. Um, so like every two months, it's getting better. It's getting better. So instead of buying, I don't know, two pairs of shoes, you buy one, one. pair, you know? And this then program. third month, you Skip don't need ahead. anything because you bought them. Yeah, you know what I mean? So it's one of those. Yeah. And, and business-wise, is there any financial thing? Uh, Business-wise, oh my gosh. Happen? I think for me, it's like, I, it's, money is such a weird thing for me. Um, I have so much anxiety around money and like business mm. money. And like, it's almost like, to the point where, um, I don't know, I'm just sometimes scared of spending like 
of just like buying new equipment because I'm like, okay, but are we fine for next month? What if we don't? So it's, it's such a tricky thing for me. Um, but yeah, we try our best to be disciplined, um, especially around the business because yeah, COVID changed it's a everything. Time. Yeah, it's it a changed very, very everything because even when when COVID hit in South Africa, we went, we didn't even have an online store, so we didn't have like direct channel to making sales. So when um, Sura announced the first lockdown and like literally all our work was cancelled, it was like all the money that we had budgeted for was gone. Yeah. And I think that taught us a lot to just, you know, be very smart about where we put things and where we take things so yeah yeah and, and you Lanzi, with regards to financial you know situations is there anything that you've done financially where you look back and you thought man i shouldn't have done that i could have handled this better um like i said earlier fitting in like just to be like okay i want to go to this restaurant with you guys or i also want to dress in this dress or just like looking at social media which is the typical generation right now like you said microwave generation you see it and you're like can't afford it but i can't not post in it so yeah i need to make a plan so i think the mistake i did do was trying to fit in getting an expensive camera too soon where no one was really complaining so i think as time went by i was like you know what trust god's timing also it will work out when it happens and you won't even feel that you didn't have a quality camera for four years because mm. by the time you do have one that's all that matters at the time so sure. yeah it was definitely a tough start mm. yeah. but you learn as you go just yeah. like he learns every two months <laughs> you also every learn months. <laughs> after every outing <laughs> after <Yeah>. every outfit <laughs> rich you know a lot of people can look at at businesses such as a fashion label or restaurants and see them as maybe not essential so when the president decides that we are locking down and and this is what's going to happen how does this impact someone like you who owns a fashion label and who has that sort of business does it impact you a lot more than than people may perceive yes uh, a lot it, we couldn't do anything we couldn't do anything and we still needed to pay some of the people that we work with so that still needed to go on while wow. like our rent and 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 is still going on so yeah. it's like it was very scary so the moment uh the president was like please make face masks we were so excited. My God. <laughs> <laughs> I ran to the fabric. So I literally like, registered yeah. for the permit. Fabric store, done. And yeah. then we like, we launched our online store. with like, I don't know, it was eight to nine masks. That was it. Took that money, made jerseys, took that money, added stock. And then now we have like drops every two months, sure. every two months. So it's like, it's a, it's a beautiful thing um, that came with it because it like put you in a corner and you had to think. Yeah, like, what how now? am I going to do this? Like, because there's nothing else. I can't knock at anyone's door. Everyone's yeah. closed. Yeah. So, yeah. Sisa, so, um, with regards to COVID, you know, the president says, it's Sunday night, the president says, from Monday morning, we are in lockdown. You know, I've just started my business. I'm a small business owner. What sort of ways are there for me to manage these lockdowns and make sure that my business uh, sustains and that after all of this, I'm still surviving it's it's very challenging and it's a very difficult thing for many small businesses how do they maneuver this field i think firstly um forgive yourself for not seeing the future <laughs> yeah you know? what could you yeah. do because i think we live a lot in regret and we don't mm -hmm. like rich said start thinking quickly about what the solution is so mm -hmm. forgive yourself because even huge businesses multinationals did not see this coming none of us saw it coming and then i think secondly the businesses that um, are agile and know how to pivot very quickly are the only businesses that are, are going to survive the next five to ten years. If you're married to something, you better get a divorce <laughs> really quick. <laughs> no, sure. Yeah, not to someone. Something. Yes, I was just about to say, not to someone. <laughs> you gotta get a divorce real Man, quick. Yeah. Yeah. Please, guys. You know I mean? <laughs> if you're married to the idea of owning 100% of your business, divorce that idea if you're mm. able to get in some in cash injection. If you're married to the idea that you want a bricks and water store, that you, you need to divorce that. Like mm. um, Rich was saying that they moved online pretty quickly. There's agencies that can help you set up an online platform, register with existing um, 
um, online platforms like your take a lot you can go there and register and ask to supply them do you know what i mean you're gonna have to think and think quickly and think out of the box mm -hmm. and you're gonna have to pivot real quick sure. they, unfortunately you don't have the you don't have time right now but use the fourth industrial revolution um, to your um, to your favor Re use it in your favor rather use your digital marketing um, use your influencers talk to people who are out on, on certain platforms and I think um, get into digital communities use digital as much as you can um, and get into e-commerce if you can and un identify the needs that have been created by this pandemic Sure. Even if it's not necessarily the business that you had set out to to to, to create, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and agility is not something that's new. It's just been fast tracked. If you told blockbusters that they would have been um, ousted by Netflix, say in ten years, they wouldn't have believed you. That's why yeah. they didn't mm -hmm. want to buy Netflix. They were so popular. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you told the pilot on a helicopter recording the news that one day there'll be a machine called a drone. That goes higher than you can he would have probably thought about things differently so try and be futuristic mm. read learn look Amazing. at futures but be agile and pivot do not marry an idea great great mm -hmm. great advice rich um as the fashion and beauty change maker um for youth x what is it that you want young people to learn from this process what is that one thing that you want them to remember when they think back at, at everything that you've said here for everything, <laughs> <laughs> everything. Um, I think so much wisdom was shared today, and I always say this: I wish there was a platform like this uh, for me when I started. Hundred percent. Whereas it's a free platform, so <laughs> I just wish um, I had that opportunity. So I think take in everything as much as you can. Rewatch this. Watch the others. It doesn't always have to be in fashion and beauty. You can learn from other disciplines as well. So just take in as much information as possible. 100%. Lanzi, you, if you want the youth watching today to take any one piece of advice that they've heard today or something that you still have uh, wanting to say, what is that one thing that you want them to leave with here today? I think it would be just starts. Don't feel like there's bigger influences out there, the space is full, it's saturated. Just starts with whatever equipment that you have because you never know where you could end up. Like myself, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, is this my life? And <laughs> it's because I just decided, you know what, let me take this seriously without even thinking of the future. So now there's platforms where you can think of the future, so they'll probably do even better. So I think just starts. Just start. Mm -hmm. And Sisa, you, what do you want the, the young people watching today to take away from today? It's National Savings Month. Okay. <laughs> 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 it is National Savings Month. I, I want you to challenge yourself to change your money ways. I want you to challenge yourself to take the money that you may have been um, budgeting for your entertainment the next two weeks while we're on lockdown to put it into something that, mm. that you can't mm. touch and you see how excited you're going to get. I know when, when like a, an investment vest for me, I'm like, Sala. you know, it's, <laughs> it's really made and I generally reinvest it if I don't need it but it really is amazing so I think just challenge yourself to set some money goals for yourself challenge yourself to set um, um, some financial money goals and put money into the in, into your future self and just have a naked conversation with your money look at your budget look at where your money is going understand your money sure. and and put something away for your future self yeah 100 percent. okay last question because we we are running out of time uh, this is a a content creation space and a social media time to Lanzi and rich uh, young people are watching young people like we spoke of earlier want to be out there wearing the yeah. best this driving the best that what is your advice to young people watching when it comes to managing their finances quickly Lanzi. I think I'd say just have a plan. Um, I mean, you can listen to everything she said today, but <laughs> one thing I learned is um, I didn't want to do it hand to mouth or like monthly, like let me do one job this month and I'll cover my expenses this month. Work in January to pay something in March. Work in March to pay something in November. Like just try to spread your finances, but also don't rob yourself of having fun, obviously. Mm. Live your best life, but responsibilities are always going to be there, but fun's also going to be there. So I think sure. just learn to spread your finances, mm. I think. Yeah. And lastly, you, Rich, what is your advice to young people who want the finer things in life? They want that soft life, but how do, we, how do they manage that? Um, I th I f fashion, style, beauty, those things don't need money. You just have to be stylish. Mm. Um, so find that, channel that, 
and you'll get it right. Like you genuinely don't need money. You can take from your mother's closet and, you know, make yourself look fabulous. Um, the greatest fashion icons don't even wear luxury brands. So I think you just have to be alert. Yeah. Yeah. And be yourself. 100% be yourself. Guys, thank you so much. Thank it was you. awesome thank to chatting you. to you guys. Pam, I think it's over to you now. Amazing. <laughs> Give it up for the power panel. All young and dynamic individuals with so much to offer. We are truly inspired. As Cisa said, please divorce those ideas in your head that might lead you astray. So if you have any questions for our power panel, do send them my way and let's get straight into it. Here's a question for Rich Mnisi. What is the process when starting a new fashion line? What goes into the planning, manufacturing to selling? Sia Sanga Mthamanzana has asked that question. Um, I think it's very different for each person. Um, it depends on how you want to approach it. So if there's some people that aren't technically skilled in making clothing. So if you just have a design, you can chat to someone who does pattern making and then they'll make the garment for you. Or if you are skilled, then I guess it's just no, then starting from the bottom of knowing what you're doing, who is it for, and I don't know, doing all that research, I think the beginning of any business should, should be research really, um, because you just need to understand where in the market you fit in and what people need and, uh, and then, you know, play into that. But in terms of starting from a manufacturing point of view, you can, there's so many options. The next question goes out to Sisa. How do you deal with the pressures of society in terms of spending, especially with the lifestyle we see on social media? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I think I, I, I've, I've shared my mistakes, so I, I haven't always been good at doing that, but I, I've learned to shut out the noise and be honest with myself um, according to my goals. Um, and I've, I'm only able to do that because I automate things like my savings because I'm not a demigod either. Um, so I, I, I take away the temptations of spending my money by automating my savings. I have um, money that goes out of my account as soon as it lands in my account, it goes straight to my savings before anything else comes up, before I touch that money. Because like I said, you do, I don't need any help messing myself up financially. I can do that all by myself. So I think once that money is out, like it's gone so what are you gonna do it's gone you know what i mean and it's it's already serving my future self so that's one thing i do to future proof my money and sometimes i take breaks from social media um if you know or you're feeling under pressure because also there's the whole like it's it, if it affects your mental state and ultimately your finances pull back amazing the next question, I think, can be answered by Lanzi and Abby Girl. Who helped you market your brand or what advice would you give a young creative on how to market themselves, starting with you, Lanzi? Um, I think, first of all, you need to know that you are your own marketer. You have to market yourself. Your platform is your CV. So just put in the work. And I don't, I don't like to say have a niche because I do believe you can put yourself in everything if you want to do beauty fashion cooking whatever it may be I think you can do it all but just have research and know what you're doing because you can get lost in the sauce and just be like <laughs> okay I'm just trying to like secure the bag everywhere but just know what you're doing remember that your profile is a CV and you have to constantly update it and keep up with the times as well you can't have your CV from 2017 looking the same in 2021 so move with the times as well 100 mm, percent, i agree i i think that you know i personally believe that no one is going to push for you as hard as you are going to push for yourself so mm -hmm. it's great to find a manager who's great at what this person does but at the end of the day uh, especially for a personal brand you need to be as hands-on mm -hmm. as you possibly can you yeah. need to know what your schedule is you need to know where you need to be today because anything can happen with your manager you know yeah. they might not answer that call you need to be ready to reply to emails as as well so i think just like a business you know rich in the beginning you are your own publicist you are your own marketer so. you are, <laughs> you are every, even with a personal brand so i think for me i, I strongly believe that no one else is going to push for you as hard as you can push for yourself yeah, yeah. and the next question goes out to rich nisi what do you look for when it comes to collaboration opportunities with other individuals or designers or organization what are some of the lessons you have learned mm. 
I look for compatibility <laughs> and what I would get out of that collaboration. Um, I think collaborations are very important, especially from a learning point of view, because it literally separates you from what you know, and you are in a new space talking a different language. So I like that interaction because you learn so much. Um, but for picking, I think it's just making sure I know where we're taking the brand and if it makes sense. Um, I think saying no has been one of the best decisions that yeah. I started making, especially, I, I think I started two years ago and I was, I say no so much. <laughs> it's, it's actually so crazy, but it saves you so much money, stress, and like almost like a, it sets your business backwards if you keep doing things that don't align with where you're trying to take the business and it sets you back and you almost have to start again and like you lose so much money sometimes because you might have to invest your own money for that calibration and then you're backwards again and then i think it's just a matter of like thinking about it properly and sometimes i think for me especially in the beginning if you're a fashion label and you think of a certain calibration maybe i don't know uh shoe polish and sometimes you need to think about it as you, you think of your favorite brand, maybe you think of Louis Vuitton. Would Louis Vuitton collaborate with a shoe polish brand? Yes, no, and make your decision off that until you get to the flow of what you want. Amazing. Yeah. I think this question also applies to Lanzi Kama for this. Uh, do you ever uh, get into a position where you have to decline any brand collaborations because of misalignment or just the campaign just does not speak to you? Um, definitely. Um, I, like I said earlier, sometimes you do make decisions based on the, f the finances because at the end of the day, one month financially you're on the top of the world and then the next month things are tricky and then that's when a campaign comes in where you would usually the previous month not take it and then you end up taking it but I think it's very important to be true to yourself because I've learned that consumers see when you do a campaign for the wrong reasons so you need to as much as it's another brand you're a brand too so you have to link and have to make sense together it shouldn't be a brand and someone working for it because you're also your own brand so those mistakes happen but also don't like feel bad about it it's a pandemic so but you'll learn as you go amazing and the next question goes out to abigail uh what inspired you to pursue a career in journalism and what did you do to grow your brand into becoming a presenter or influencer etc Sure. So I think from a very young age, I always knew that I, I absolutely love being in front of the camera and television is something that I really, really wanted to do. But getting into the industry is extremely difficult. You don't find auditions. You don't find these sort of places where you can say, listen, I'm putting my hand up. I want to do this. So for me, a big part of it was networking you know, finding the right people, making sure that I reach out to these people. I send that email, I pick up the phone and I call, I make sure my CV is submitted and I follow up. Yes, later in your career, you can have a, an amazing manager, but even that is so, so difficult to find, especially in television. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely say once again, it is completely up to you. You need to go out there, you need to network, you need to be hands on when it comes to your career. And that's how you build and grow in this industry. Amazing. Uh, the last question uh, is for, for Lanzi, rather. When did you start partnering with brands or other content creators and how does one start the conversation? What examples can you share where these partnerships were successful? Um, I started in 2017. Um, that's when I started making money from it and I got a big campaign, which subsequently other brands started to notice me and that's where I got basically my big break if i can say um in terms of collaborating with other influencers i think dming people don't be shy some do respond also go to events if you see someone posting somewhere just make the sacrifice or take that shot and go there and network and speak to other people and that person could be like actually you'd be good for this campaign or speak to other influencers who you are in the same space as you and say, I'd like to work with this brand, for example, and I could have the email directly to the brand manager. You can send your proposal. So definitely networking, I think, with any career, really. Speak to other people, don't be shy. Um, but I'm not going to act like I didn't get a big break. But you also can't get a big break and then just sit. You have to put in the work and go out there.
basically keep the momentum going yep amazing thank you so much to our panel power panel rather our facilitator abigail fesahi uh see sandy lekikido our head of investments at nitbank uh or rich nisi our change maker for fashion and beauty and of course our local change maker for today lenzi gama remember their names they all dynamic young individuals who are making their mark in south africa and you could be too you just have to keep it unlocked to the youth x platform and you might just be unlocking your full potential What an awesome and informative event that we've had today. I absolutely loved every moment of it and I obviously came dressed for the occasion because it was definitely the fashion and beauty leg of our Youth X uh, live um uh, events of course so ladies and gentlemen i hope you enjoyed the session and are truly inspired to take the next step to unlocking your full potential stay tuned to the unlock.me website and social media pages for more information on our next youth x live event coming up this month with the former banyana banyana captain amanda Lamini. so to our social media uh, or media guests rather please do join us in the breakaway room where you can start interacting and asking further questions to our guests and make sure you get all the meats out of them they're here to answer every question and be on the lookout for the breakaway room link that will pop up on your screen just shortly and that ladies and gentlemen is how we officially wrap up today's edition thank you for joining us today we look forward to hosting you next on the youth x live events and thank you for having me as your host my name is pam lamtanga and you should definitely give it unlocked Thank you for joining us for this Youth X Live session. Catch our change maker next time when we talk sports and wellness. See you then.